Yeah, welcome everybody to our uh, next BCAST seminar, which is now in a bi-weekly uh, regular schedule. Um, just to remind you, um, in two weeks there will be supercomputing, so uh, we do not dare to compete uh, with, <laughs> with the conference. Um, and then without further ado, I would like to give the word to Nikolai to introduce our speaker, uh, Ji Dong Jai, a long-term uh, collaborator and friend. So go ahead. Thank you, Torsten, and welcome everyone again to SPCL BCAST. I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Zhidong Zhai from Xinhua, where he is a tenured associate professor in the computer science department. He's won a number of awards throughout his time, uh, as well as published numerous papers and, and uh, best paper finalists and winners. I, in addition to his uh, academic work, he also leads the Xinhua student cluster team, which has won, I believe, nine competitions over the years. Uh, and without further ado, I'll let Zhidong tell us about lightweight performance analysis. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, today my talk is lightweight performance analysis for next generation HPC systems. And uh, okay, first, uh, let me give some background about this work. You know, the performance of current HPC systems is increasing exponentially. Current the fastest supercomputer is the Japanese uh, Fukaku, uh, with the computational performance uh, is more than 400 petaflops and with more than 7 million processor cores. And the fastest supercomputer in China is the Sunway Type Light uh, with more than 10 million processor cores. Uh, and <clears throat> an obvious uh, trend in current HPC domain is uh, a, lot, a lot of heterogeneous accelerators uh, has been, have been widely used. Uh, uh, in recent years, a large number of domain-specific domain -specific, uh, specific, uh, processors uh, uh, are developed, such as Google TPO, MIT Iris. And, uh, and as you know, currently the US uh, Europe and China are building uh, the next generation supercomputers, the exascale supercomputer. The first DOE exascale supercomputer, Aurora, will also use the Intel XE heterogeneous uh, processors. So, so under this trend, uh, the programming and the performance are really a big challenge for current HPC developers. Um, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, I know the last year, the, uh, I think the stateful uh, programming framework uh, de uh, developed by the Torsten Group received the best paper of IC conference. I think uh, that framework is just to solve the programming issues. And also the performance also is very challenging. And here I want to share a story in our group. And about two or three years ago, we our group ported the graph file 100 to the summit half light uh, with more than 10 million processor cores. And you know this, uh, the original BFS program uh, for the parallel version is about 100 uh, source line. But when we ported this program to a large scale supercomputer and we encountered a lot of performance issues. <clears throat> for example, on about, uh, about 3000 computing nodes, we, this program can't uh, scale anymore. And after we do a lot of performance analysis, we, we found uh, the MPI collective, <coughs> MPI collective communication uh, on the semi type light uh, has some issues. When we fix this issue, and this program can be scaled uh, further. And finally, this, pro, uh, this porting work project and take about one period student uh, for one year programming efforts. And finally, this program was ranked number two in the latest uh, graph 500 list. But the question here is that if you optimize some real uh, HPC applications on a very large scale supercomputers, we really need some efficient performance tools to understand the performance issues of both application and systems. So first, let's look at some previous work about performance analysis. One main approach uh, is the profiling, profiling, such as the MPIP, G-Profile, and we have a lot of profiling tools. And profiling-based approaches are very lightweight and also 
very scalable. But uh, these tools have very uh, has very limited information, and they always need expertise knowledge to identify performance issues. And another main approach is tracing-based approaches, such as the Intel ITC, ITA, and also the DTrace for memory trace analysis. And these tools can provide much more fine-grained information, but they are not scalable. The main reason is that the volume of trace size will increase as the system scale and the problem size. And here I give an example. When we run ASIC SMG 2000 with a small problem size on about 22,000 processes, it will generate about 5 terabyte communication trees. So, okay, in summary, and the pre uh, previous performance analysis tools only use the runtime information and to analyze the program performance and they, they ignore the source code. <clears throat> but currently, you know, we have a lot of source code analysis tools, such as compilers, RRVM compiler, and source to source compiler rules. And with the source code analysis, and it can provide top down picture, just like this, the right figure uh, for given parallel programs. And with this big picture, you can get the runtime analysis. And another main advantage of the source code analysis, it, is, it has very low overhead and also have very good scalability. The overhead of source code analysis is independent of problem size and job skill, and it only depends on the code size. So based on this observation, we have, uh, we have uh, combine, we have combined the static information and the dynamic information for efficient performance analysis. And the core idea is that as the static phase, we will collect some information with the compilation techniques, such as the program control structure and so on. And at runtime, we will run this program and also collect some runtime information and combine the static information and the runtime information for very efficient performance analysis. And based on this idea, we have built, we have developed a lot of tools, such as the Scalana. And this tool is used to identify scaling loss, detect scaling loss problems. And the V-Sensor is a performance burn detection tool. Spindle is a memory access monitoring tool. Cypress is, uh, is used for the trace compression. And the fact is used for the trace collection. And today I will talk about uh, two or three systems. Okay, first let's look at the Cypress. Cypress is for top-down communication trees compression. Communication trees uh, are very useful for HPC application developers, and they can be used for uh, detect the performance issue or performance bottleneck. They can also be used for the communication optimization. And you will see we can also use communication trees to design a future HPC systems. And the right figure show a segment of MPI communication trees. <clears throat> Usually, the MPI communication trees contain message ID, uh, message type, size, source, destination, and, and the execution time. And here, this figure shows the communication patterns extracted from MPI communication trees for NPB programs. From this figure, you can find there, there is communication localities for these parallel programs. And also we can use communication trees to predict the performance for future large-scale supercomputers. For example, you can run a large-scale parallel application on a leading edge systems, and you can get communication and computation trees then you input the network parameters of the future systems to a trace-driven simulator. Then you can get the predict the performance. So communication trees are very useful, but the trace volume will increase dramatically with the problem size and the job skill. And the large communication trees not only bring pressure on underlying storage systems, but also it can interfere with the application execution. So when we 
look closely about their communication trees, we can find there is large, uh, uh, there is significant redundancy in these communication trees. Uh, first, in the temporal uh, dimension, for example, within uh, each process, due to the iterative time steps, and uh, we can have repeated communication operations for different iteration. And also, second, in the spatial dimension ac across different processes, uh, as most of parallel programs are SPMD, so different processes also tend to do the same communication operations. So we have a lot of uh, redundancy in these communication trees. So realizing this, a lot of researchers have perform uh, how use the bottom up approach to do their communication trees compression and they compress MPI communication trees on the fly. For example, the scalar trees and the scalar trees two uh, were developed by the Frank Muller groups. And there are two steps for traditional bottom up approach. The first one is the intro process compression just to identify the repeated patterns within one process. Here, let's look at an example. Assume this is, uh, these are the communication trees. You can see the BC, BC are repeated for many times. So if you identify this repeated pattern, you can compress this communication trees just like this. So here I use uh, animation to show how the intro process uh, do, do the compression. Here you can see uh, I use a different color to show the different communication invocations. So you can see we have a lot of repeated communication patterns within each process. For example, in process zero, we have the yellow bar, yellow bar. So after intro process compression, we can compress the repeated pattern within each process just like this. Okay, the next step is the inter-process compression just to identify repeated communication pattern across different processes. Here you can see, for example, you can see the process zero, process two, and the process with the even numbers have the similar communication patterns. Here you can see the yellow bar and also the blue bar. So in the, also for, for the process one, process three, and also the process with their own numbers also have their similar communication patterns. Then you can perform the inter-process compression just like this. So after inter-process and the inter-process compression, we can do the communication trees compression. This is a traditional bottom-up approaches. But there, there are also some limitations for bottom-up compression. The first, let's look at the inter-process. Sometimes, it is very expensive with very complex communication patterns. Here, we also see an example just like this. You can see this example has a nested loop here and here, and also has a branch. And you can see in this loop, the loop count is dependent on this variable. And this variable is from here. And this variable is different for different loop iteration. We also have a branch here. So the red figure shows the communication trees for this MPI programs. You can see this MPI communication trees are more complex. So based on previous study, we can also compress this communication trees on the fly, but the compression overhead are very large just because you need to design a very complex compression algorithm to compress the repeated communication pattern. Also, let's look at the inter-process compression, and it is also even more expensive. Here, you I also give an example. You can see the left is the compressed communication trees for process zero, and the right is the compressed communication trees for process one. You can see they don't have the same communication patterns. So when we compress process zero and process one, you need to compare the communication trees one by one. And finally, this is a compressed trees for process zero and process one. You can see you can't compress anything just because don't have the similar thing, but you need to compare one by one. So the computation complexity to compress 
to process is O n square. So the compression overhead will be very large if you compress a very large scale MPI programs. Okay, so to address this challenge, we, we propose a, a top-down technique. The core idea we just compile the static information and the dynamic for efficient trace compression. The first step, we just do the static analysis and we extract program communication structure tree. And the second step, at the runtime, we use this tree as a template and just fill in the runtime information. Okay, uh, so this is the overview of our system. The input is, is an MPI program and, and then we need to do some static analysis. Then we need to, then we, we will up, uh, up to the uh, program communication structure tree. And at the runtime, we need to execute this program and with this communication structure tree, and we perform the dynamic trace compression. Okay, first let's look at how we do the static analysis in our systems. Okay, here uh, I also use an example to show how we build the communication structure tree. And you can see in the left figure, we have three functions. The first one is the main function, and the second one is a bar. The third one is full. And you can see, we will build a local communication structure tree for each function during the intro procedural analysis, just like this. So first, we need to insert a virtual root node. And you, you note, for this loop, we insert a loop node. And then for this branch, we insert two branch nodes. And also for MPI send and MPI receive, we insert two MPI communication node here. And also for these two user defined function bar and foo, we also insert two nodes here. And then for this branch, we insert two nodes here. So with a similar method, we can build the local CST communication structure tree for each function. Then in the inter procedure, we need to combine all the local CST to, for the global CST. And you can see this is a global CST for this program. And the core idea is, is that we just need to replace the user defined function with their local CST. So you can get the global CST for this MPI program. And you can see the leaf nodes are, are all green. These are MPI communication invocations such as send, receive, broadcast. And other nodes are branch and loops denotes the program control structures. Okay, and when we, after, we, after building the CST, and then we need to do some instrumentation in the programs, and we, we need to insert two extra functions before and after control structure to inform dynamic module. Okay, next let's look at the dynamic analysis. And we also, in our approach, we also have two phases. The first one also is the intro process compression. And during the intro process compression, we'll use a pointer here, the pointer to track the program execution. And you can see when this pointer point to a loop node, we need to increase the loop count. And when this pointer point to a branch node, we need to record the taken status for this branch node. And when this pointer point to the MPI communication nodes, we need to do trace compression and, do, and compress the communication trace. So this is an inter-process compression. And the second step is the inter-process compression. And after inter-process compression, we have a compressed trace, compressed trace tree for each MPI process. They are the same, same tree you can see, but maybe different process will ask you different paths. So during the inter-process compression, we just compare corresponding nodes in trees, just like this. We compare two loop nodes. If they are same, we compress. And next, we compress a branch node. They are different. We need to record their individual information. So the core idea here is that we just need to compare n pairs n pairs of tree node. So the computation complexity of approach is O n 
and different with the traditional bottom-up approaches, the complexity is O n square. So our approach is very efficient for very large scale uh, parallel applications. Okay, so for these systems, we have evaluated this system with some NPB programs and also a real MPI, uh, a real applications on typical supercomputers. And we also compare our work with the GZIP or offline compression tool and also scalar trees. Scalar trees is an online compression tool and this tool is lossless. And we also compare with the scalar trees tool. This tool also is an online compression tool. And this tool is lossy compression. And our tool also is lossless. We, 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 we will uh, keep all the information. <clears throat> Okay, first let's look at. Okay, first let's look at some of uh, the tree size. You can see uh, we use a different color to show the compressed tree size for the GZIP, scalar trees, scalar trees two, and also separate plus GZIP. And you can see for most par uh, parallel programs, we get a similar compression rate with the scalar trees and the scalar trees two. But for some programs, uh, for the FT, LU, and uh, uh, and also the EP, we, we get much better compression rate than, than the scalar trees and the scalar trees too. And this figure shows the inter-process compression overhead. You can see the, the, the red bar is the scalar trees and the blue bar is the scalar trees too. And the yellow bar is our approach. You can see the scalar trees introduce uh, about 50% compression overhead. And the scalar trees too is 9%, but our approach is only 1% uh, compression overhead. And this figure shows the in the process compression overhead. And also you can see the scalar trees, the red bar, the average compression overhead is about 170%, but our approach, the yellow bar, is only 3%. And we compare, compare the scalar trees tool. Scalar trees tool is a lossy compression method. We can also get nine times speed up over the scalar trees tool. Okay, uh, this is a summary, the compression overhead for different approach, approaches. And in this table, and we also, uh, in this table, we also show the compilation uh, time for approach. And you can uh, this uh, in second. You can see for the NPP programs, the compilation time is very small. Okay, so this is the first systems. The second system is V sensor, and V sensor is used for performance variance detection. So if if you uh, if you have run uh, parallel programs on large scale supercomputers you may get varied performance across different executions, even on the same computing node. And here I give an example, and we run the NPB FT uh, program on Tianhe 2 system. This is a Chinese uh, large scale supercomputer and uh, on uh, with 124 processes and for 40 times. And the Y axis shows the execution time. You can see, the worst case, the worst case is about three times uh, than the best one. So we call this performance variance. If there is performance, the programs become slow and unstable, and they, they also consume more resources, and it is very hard to understand its behavior. So we need to understand the performance variance. First, let's look at the source uh, the, the reasons for the performance variance. The, the first main reason is the hardware errors. For example, the network error or the memory error can also cause the performance variance. Here I give an example, the, the memory device errors. And if you have a lot of memory errors in the memory device, the ECC and will help you correct the error, but it will cause, uh, it, it will introduce significant performance degradation for, for fine-grained parallel programs. The second reason is operating system interruption. The interruption also can cause performance variance. 
And also on large scale supercomputer, a lot of results are shared by a lot of users, such as the network and also the IO device shared by a lot of users. So when there is a resource competition, we can also have performance variance. So detecting system performance variance can not only help users to understand the program's performance, but also can help administrators to investigate system problems. First, let's look at how the previous uh, work to identify the performance variance. The first one, you can rerun your programs many times on the supercomputers and you can identify the performance variance, but it is very time consuming. You need to run many times and, and, and identify the performance variance. And second, you can also build an accurate performance model to identify performance variance. But, uh, you know, build an accurate performance model is very challenging for some complex uh, parallel programs. And also, third, you can also use profiling tracing tools to identify performance variance. But these tools always need require expert knowledge. Maybe for normal user, they can't identify performance variance with these tools. And the last one, maybe you can imagine when you run your applications, you can at the same time, you can also run a micro benchmark to identify the performance variance. But if you run another micro benchmark, maybe this benchmark can interfere with your, your application code and it is int intrusive. So here the question is that, what if the benchmarks are part of an application? Maybe we can easily to identify the performance variance. So here I want to give an observation for the typical parallel applications. We found, we found that many programs contain code snippets that are executed repeatedly with fixed workload. And here I give an example. And you can see in this loop, we have two modules, the red one and the green one. And here I use different circles to show different workload. You can see the red one, the workload change for different iterations but the green part, the workload is fixed. So, the, so for, for the green part, we can use the green part as a benchmark inside the program to detect the performance variance. And we don't need ex external work and also no resource competition. So, uh, and here we use fixed workload snippets as variance sensors, in short, V sensors. And the core idea of V sensor is just we need to find out all the fixed workload within the user programs. And then we analyze their execution time to detect system performance variance. Just like this, we identify all the fixed workload. Then we test their execution time. Then we, we analyze the performance variance. So the idea is very simple, but there are many benefits for this idea. The first one, it is very easy to detect and locate performance variance. And we also don't need to build a complex performance model. And we also don't need expert knowledge. And also this approach introduces very low overhead and requires little manual effort. Next, let's look at the workflow of our system. The input of our system also is also uh, is a source code. And we, we will use some compiler to translate the source code to intermediate re representation. And then we in the compiler with some compilation techniques, we identify all the fixed workload. Then we use a source to source compiler to, trans to, <clears throat> to translate the source code and do some instrumentation. And next, we use the native compilers to compile the instrumented programs at the runtime and we identify the performance variance. So this is the workflow for our systems. There are two main modules in this system. The first one, how we identify the fixed workload for a given parallel program. The second one, how we identify performance variance at the runtime. Okay, here I give a short introduction about what's, what, what are the fixed workload snippets. 
And in our work, we define three types of fixed workload. The first one is a computation with the same number and the same sequence of instructions. Second one is a network communication with the same message size and also with the same MPI communication, uh, MPI uh, parameters. The third one is the IO operations and also with the same IO data <coughs> size uh, and also the same read or write types. <coughs> and also in our system to reduce analysis overhead, we only need loops and the function calls are considered as potential candidates for these sensors. First, let's look at the intro procedural analysis. And you can see the workload is determined by the control expressions of loops and branches. <clears throat> and here uh, you see an example. You can see in this example, we have a loop n and here, and we uh, within this uh, the loop n, we have three loops, one, two, three. First, let's look at the loop one. You can see the workload for the loop one is dependent on this variable n, and this n is transformed transform from here. So this, the value of variable n will change for different loop iterations. Then the workload for the loop one also change for different loop, loop iteration. And also we, uh, we see the loop two. You can see within loop two, we have a branch. And, and also we have a, a variable n and n is from here. So the branch, maybe for the different variable, we have different taken status for this branch. So the workload for loop two also maybe change for different loop iteration. So after intro procedural analysis, we can identify loop one and loop two, the workload of them are not fixed. But you can see for the loop three, the workload is fixed. <coughs> okay, next, uh, let's look at the interprocedural analysis. And here I also use an example to show how we do interprocedural analysis. You can see the workload is also affected by function arguments. Here, you can see the loop one. The loop one, the workload is dependent on this variable x, and this x is transferred from here. And when we do interprocedural analysis, we can know x is from here and here. And you can see the n will, n will the value of n will change for different loop iteration. So the loop one is not fixed workload, but you can see the loop two is a fixed workload and the loop two can be used to identify performance variance. <clears throat> so when we identify all the fixed workloads, we need to insert tick and talk function calls to record execution time and at runtime and trigger <coughs> periodically analysis. Just like this, we identify some fixed workload. I in, uh, we insert some tick and talk function calls here and record the execution time for the different V sensors. And at runtime, when we collected all the execution time for these V sensors, and we also need to do the normalization. And just like this, for the shorted execution time, the relative performance is one just here. And for longer execution, it will have smaller relative performance value. For example, for this V sensor, the execution time is 13 seconds. So the normalization results is much smaller. And we also, uh, to improve the coverage of detection, we also merge, uh, uh, merge the same time with sensors to analysis the performance variance. Just like this, we merge with sensor one and with sensor two. And at last, we also, our system also provide a visualization to show the final results and here, uh, we use a different color to show the different normalization results. And here, darker is better. And also, uh, y-axis show where the performance variance for different processes. And x-axis show when the performance variance. So a typical output just like this. You can see in this output, the light color, light color blocks 
shows the bad performance or we call the performance variance. And when we also see the, the V sensor types, maybe for the network, IO, or computation, we can know the reason about the performance variance. And we also evaluate these systems on some typical large scale supercomputers and uh, with some micro benchmark and also some real application and test up to 16,000 MPI processes. And this is uh, some basic results for our systems. And here, uh, one result I want to emphasize here, you can see the average overhead is 2%. And because most of the work are done as a static phase, so the runtime overhead is very small. So this approach can be used for future or next generation large scale supercomputer to detect performance variance. And we also de detected some pro real problems on Tianhe 2 system. The first one, we identify a memory channel uh, address. This memory channel only offers only 50% of typical memory bandwidth and cause about 20% performance loss. And we report this bug, uh, memory bug uh, to the administrator of Tianhe 2. The second one, we identify an unexpected network problem. And this problem will waste about 43 seconds for this program. You can see the white color here and have a network hung during the execution. So with our tools, we can know what happened for the performance variance. Okay, so this is the second system we sensor. And currently we also improve these systems. Maybe uh, the first one, currently we also do some uh, improvement for varied, uh, for varied workload. And in this work, we just identify the fixed workload, but uh, Currently, we also improve these systems and we can also identify some repeated patterns. And if I can identify the patterns, we can also use this pattern to detect the performance variance. And we can also insert some fixed workload in parallel programs to identify performance variance. Okay, next, uh, I will introduce the spindle, the third systems. And this system is used for memory Access on as, uh, memory access analysis. And you know the memory, memory analysis is very important for application developers. The first memory access is error prone, which can cause a lot of bugs, such as data reads, deadlock. Second, memory access is a key factor of performance. The third one, memory access also has high security risk. The hackers can use such as, uh, for example, can use the buffer flow to attack systems. Therefore, we need memory access monitoring for bug detection, performance optimization, and malware analysis. But full monitoring for a long running program will introduce large overhead. And here, uh, uh, we have a lot of dynamic tools to analyze memory patterns, for example, Intel pin were green to help us to, add, to analyze the memory behavior. And for these tools, they need to modify instruction flow at runtime and to insert checking functions. For examples, when we analyze the memory access patterns for these programs, and for Intel pin, it needs to check all memory access one by one and record all memory access for tracing. And usually these tools will introduce maybe more than 100 times, times uh, slowdown and also generate a large volume of tree size. And to, to address these problems and also some researchers such as a researcher in Google, they have developed the address sanitizer and the memory sanitizer. And they also use the static and uh, dynamic information to reduce the, the analysis overhead but based on our observation, uh, our evaluation, we also find these tools also introduce also do uh, a lot of redundant work, and they introduce about two times slowdown. So here we see how we can use the patterns to avoid memory access patterns to to avoid redundant check, and 
you can uh, for this simple example, what will be the memory access addresses for this program? And it is very easy. It is a a plus four, a plus eight, and so on. So here only you, you can you uh, from 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 this example you can see only the starting address a and the loop count n are unknown at static. So we need to record at runtime, just like this. Then if we just if we know the values of a and n, we can compute other memory memory access uh, memory access addresses. And we don't we don't need other checkings. So with this method, we can reduce the checking from n to. So the core idea here is that we need to compute what is computable and record the rest at runtime. So based on this simple idea, we have built a general memory access monitoring platform. We call this system spindle. And the spindle is a general platform for memory access. You can use this platform to build other tools for memory analysis. And based on this framework, we have built a tool called S Tracer for memory tracing. And we've also built another tool, S Detector, and for memory bug detection. <coughs> And there are two main steps in, uh, our, in, our, in our system. The first one, we need also analyze the source code to find the memory access patterns at the compile time, such as we need to identify loops branches. And the second step, we need to record non-computable par parameters at runtime, such as the program input random man number. And the next, I will show how we build the S tracer with our platform. The first step, we do some common source code analysis. And this step is very similar with the traditional control flow analysis. And here I use a bubble sort program to show how we do, uh, how we do the memory analysis. And you can see for the bubble sort program, we have two functions. The first one is a bubble sort. The second one is a swap. <clears throat> So during the common source code analysis, and we need to build a data structure called MCFG, just like this. This is the MCFG for the bubble sort function. You can see this structure is very similar with the traditional CFG control flow graph. And you can see we have loop nodes for this one and loop one for this one. And we also have branch, branch and we also have function call here. And but different with the traditional CFG, we also insert the memory access in this data structure, such as we have two load memory load here, load one and load two. And also you can see for the swap function, we record the two load and the two store because this function is very simple, no other program control structures. So this is the MCFG for bubble sort. This is the MCFG for the swap function. This is the first step. And then and we need to analyze the memory access patterns. And here you can see, I give an example for this memory access. This is an intermediate representation in RRVM compiler. And with this IR, we can build a memory dependence tree just like this during the intro procedural analysis. And then we do the inter procedural analysis, we can we can know that this S is from A just like this. This is in the procedural analysis. So this is a memory dependent tree in our systems. And with this tree, we can know for this variable, the initial value and increment of L0 is fixed. We don't need to instrument. And in this example, we only need to record the address for A, and we also need to record the loop count N and we also need to record the, for this branch for the taken status. So other things we can get from the static analysis. <clears throat> okay, so with our approach and for this bubble sort and the trace, we have two parts. The first one is a static trace. This static trace is just extracted from the MCFG 
and we have the pro program control structures just like this loops and also branches and we also have the dynamic trees dynamic trees are collected at runtime and here we have the value for the variable a and we have the value for the variable n and also we record the taken status for the branch so you can see with our approach we have very small tree size just with the static trees and the dynamic trees. Okay, we also, based on our framework, we also build as detector for memory bug detection. And you can see our paper for more details. And we also evaluate uh, a lot of programs for this system because this system is submitted, uh, submitted for, for two or three uh, conferences. So after uh, each recycle, uh, we have added a lot, uh, a lot of programs. And first, we we, we evaluate with the NPB programs, and also the spec, uh, a lot of program from the spec CPU, and also the uh, multi-thread program from Parsec benchmarks, and also some applications such as the BFS, also some big data and machine learning applications. <coughs> and here, this figure shows the. A tree size for our approach, uh, our approach is the, the black bar. And we also compare our approach with the Intel pin. You can see our approach can achieve orders of magnitude reduction in tree size from the pin baseline. And the red figure shows the slowdown. You can see the S tracer can reduce slowdown from pin by a factor of 61 times on average. Okay, this is our third system. And the last one is a uh, uh, Scalana, and uh, this system also is a collaboration collaboration work with the uh, uh, professor Thorsten Hofler. And the next week is the IC conference. So here I just uh, give a very short introduction, and next week you can uh, the Yuyang will give a complete presentation for this work. And this work uh, we just want to solve the problem how we can very efficiently to identify the, uh, the scalability problems uh, for the parallel programs. For example, when we run MPBS on Tianhe 2 systems, and uh, for, for the class D data set, when, uh, uh, after 256 uh, processes, this program can't scale. So we need uh, some tool to identify the performance uh, issues for, the, uh, for these programs. So this is a workflow of our systems. And we also have the static analysis and we'll build some program structure graph. And we also have some runtime analysis for we, we need to uh, collect some PMU data and also some uh, call stack information and also MPI uh, communication invocations. And uh, at last we'll build a program performance uh, graph. And uh, with this graph, uh, finally we'll uh, do the scaling loss detection and identify the root cause. Uh, a main contribution for this work uh, is that we perform backward tra traversal on the program performance graph and uh, just like this through the intro process data and control dependence and also inter process communication dependence and connect problematic vertex with backtracking paths and finally, we identify the root cause in the backtracking, uh, in the backtracking path. And uh, at last, we identify the root cause just like this. We identify this node as a root cause for these programs. And we also evaluate uh, a lot of applications uh, on large scale supercomputers. And we also optimize these programs. OK, so uh, I just uh, give a short introduction about these systems. So, uh, at last, uh, I want to give a summary for my today talk. And today I have talked uh, a lot about how we combine the static information and the dynamic information for very efficient performance analysis. I think this, uh, these tools, uh, because these tools introduce very small overhead, so they can be used uh, maybe for the future large scale supercomputers. <coughs> Currently, we also build a, a general framework uh, to, to integrate other techniques uh, 
uh, this in this framework, we, we have the static analysis module and uh, we use the RVM compiler to do some source code analysis. And currently we also use the Dagenst and uh, performance tool to do the binary analysis. And you know, uh, when we do analyze the binaries, we can also get a lot of information. And we also, uh, another module is a dynamic module. We we'll use the instrumentation, PMU, and other techniques to collect the dynamic data. So with the static module, we can get the program structure, data dependence, and so on. And with the dynamic module, we can collect the communication dependence, also some runtime information. So we combine the static data and the dynamic data, we can build the program structure or performance graph. And then with this graph, we can build a lot of performance tools. Current, we have built the trace compression, separates, and also memory uh, monitor, spindle, performance variant detection with sensor, and uh, also scaling loss detection, Scalana. And we, we also use this idea to build more tools to uh, for the lightweight performance analysis. <clears throat> okay, so to conclude, uh, I think uh, today uh, for my talk, uh, the most important information I want to convey is that the static information is very useful uh, for performance analysis. And the static information can provide very reliable insight for given parallel programs. And also the analysis overhead is very small and also is independent with the problem size and the job skill. But uh, although we have built a lot of tools with this idea, but uh, we have uh, encountered a lot of challenge, uh, such as, uh, for example, uh, uh, in the compiler, the alias analysis, uh, alias pointer, uh, pointer analysis is a very challenging job. So for some C or C++ programs, it is very difficult to do the pointer analysis. So we just do some controversial uh, analysis. And another challenge is sometimes we don't have the source code for the parallel programs. Maybe we only have the binary, but for this challenge current, we also use the Dainz developed by Wisconsin University. And with, uh, with this, uh, tools, we can do some binary analysis. And through the binary analysis, we can also extract some program structures, uh, such as loops and also some jump instructions. And we can also identify other information. So, uh, so I think uh, that's all. OK, thank you. Thank you, Zhidong, for the, the excellent talk. I, I learned quite a bit. Um, so before we move to questions, I do want to give uh, two, two brief notes. Uh, supercomputing is coming up, as Torsten said. So there is no SPCL vcast on November 19th. Uh, please enjoy the, the talks. Uh, our next vcast talk will be on the 3rd of December at 9 AM with Jesper Larson Traff discussing decomposing MPI collectives to exploit multi-lane communication.